Hello everyone, followers and readers of Arab Hospital Magazine. Today we are pleased to have with us Dr. Amar Barakat, the Medical Director of Neuroendocrine Tumor Program at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center and Associate Professor of Surgery at Baylor's College of Medicine with more than 25 years of experience in diagnosing and treating benign and malignant diseases of the liver, bile duct, gallbladder, and pancreas. Welcome, Dr. Barakat. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, we are honored to have uh, you with us today. Uh, we're going to discuss the most complex part of the human body after the brain. <laughs> so the digestive system and its diseases. Uh, I would like to start uh, my interview by discussing your professional interest in liver and uh, pancreas surgery. Why did you choose uh, this path? It's, uh, we know that it's a very challenging path in, uh, in medicine. Yeah. Um, when I, you see, I grew up in, uh, in Aleppo and uh, in a household, um, all doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, mom was a pediatrician and my dad was a surgeon. And uh, my dad always been my kind of uh, role model. Um, he was a very great surgeon and uh, he used to do a lot of complex uh, uh, liver surgery at that time. In the 60s and 70s, he used to do what we call those portal cable shunt. And uh, at that time, uh, that kind of equivalent to like have an open heart surgery. Yeah. And when I was in medical school, I used to go with him all the time and and help him with these operations, and I got mesmerized and hooked um, into liver surgery at that time. Um, in Syria, as like in any part of the Middle East, um, there are a lot of patients with liver diseases. Yes. Um, and um, in the early 80s, when uh, liver transplantation became popular, um, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to come over <clears throat> and do liver transplantation. So when I finished my uh, uh, medical school there and did my general surgery residency there after four years, I came over here and uh, did, redid my general surgery and got into fellowship in liver transplantation uh, at, in Houston, Texas. And um, afterward, um, I went to England and did more liver transplantation. And in England also gave me an opportunity to uh, do more of uh, hepatobiliary and pancreas surgery. So after five years in England, I came back to Houston, and uh, that's why all my life was about liver and pancreas now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, doctor, we know that the human digestive system is very complex, and people usually get confused when they have any symptom related to this area. Um, when someone should seek uh, medical assistance uh, uh, with any symptom, for example, if you have an abdominal pain, maybe, uh, yeah. should you go directly to the doctor or uh, because people are not used to go immediately to the doctor, especially with the abdominal pains and everything? Um, you, you see, as a hepatobiliary surgeon, um, I see it time and again, patient coming into our clinic with advanced uh, cancer. And the reason why yeah. is because a lot of patients come in, uh, 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 complain of those non-specific vague abdominal pain, which goes on for many weeks and months and even years. Um, they go and see their primary care doctor or GI doctor who kind of mistakenly diagnose those patients having irritable bowel syndrome, for example. Mm -hmm. And until they uh, dive in more and try to investigate it further, and they found that they have, oh, they have pancreatic cancer or gastric or stomach cancer or bowel cancer. Um, so any any vague abdominal pain, non-specific, it's not going away with treatment, conventional treatment. You have to uh, pursue more um, uh, diagnostic investigations and go see a specialist. Uh, if you pick up these cancer early uh, stages, you'll probably be able to cure them. But unfortunately, 50% of our patients who comes to our clinic, they already had metastatic disease. Yeah. And the reason why is the delay in that diagnosis, especially they have an abdominal pain and they say, oh, it's my, maybe I have a gastritis or a stomach yeah. ulcer. They take antiacids and turn out that it's not getting better, maybe improved a little bit, but it's still there. Uh, so when you have pain is not subsiding with conventional treatment, 
you have to uh, pursue it and don't ignore it. Okay. So, but uh, we know that uh, diagnosing diseases of the liver, uh, bile duct, gallbladder, and pancreas can be challenging and contradictory in some cases. Uh, what are the latest technologies in uh, diagnostic that you are using now? Well, the, um, the diagnosis for pancreatic cancer or liver cancers or bile duct cancer um, actually improved a lot in the last 20, 25 years. And we have a lot of uh, diagnostic modalities now to pick up early cancers. Um, it's not much of coming up with new technology as much as improving the technology we had already. Um, for example, uh, uh, routine blood tests, you can pick up cell elevation of some of the enzymes of liver, um, liver enzymes and that can kind of alert us that there might be something going on with the liver. Um, unfortunately, in tumor markers, um, they have not improved. There's no single tumor marker. It's kind of to, to say uh, this is 100% diagnostic for cancer, but um, they're all the sensitivity about these tumor markers is probably about 50 to 60%. Um, from the imaging standpoint, the CAT scans and the MRI, they're still the gold standard. Yeah. Uh, the technique of the CT scan and MRI improved dramatically in the last 20 years. Uh, they're becoming more high definition and, and we can pick up early cancer, even small cancers in the liver or pancreas. Um, the other modalities is the MRCP, which is basically MRI specific for the uh, bile duct, which map out the whole entire uh, biliary system. Mm -hmm. It's not invasive um, and there's no radiation to it, uh, unfortunately, but it does not provide any therapeutic uh, options. And uh, the MRCP... Is it accurate 100% when you do the MRCP? MRCP is pretty sensitive. So uh, if somebody come in with kind of jaundice and I believe that there might be a blockage in the bile duct somewhere, the first thing I do is get an MRCP mm -hmm. uh, because before I do ERCP, before I do anything else, mm -hmm. um, because uh, MRCP, as I said, it will map out the entire biliary system and will pick up where the blockage is and what's going on. Um, if I find a blockage somewhere in the biliary system, uh, then I'll ask for an ERCP, especially if the blockage in the lower end of the bile duct. Uh, the ERCP, it's kind of an invasive procedure. Like when they do endoscopy, they put a camera inside the stomach, pass it into the bile duct, <clears throat> and see where the blockage is in the bile duct, and then they can put a stent across the blockage, or they can biopsy the uh, the tumor, if they find the tumor, or they can brush the lining of the bile duct to get uh, to get some samples from the biliary system. Also, the new ERCPs um, scopes, they have ability to put a fine colidocoscope, which is basically a scope, a very tiny one. They can get into the bile duct to see the inside the bile duct and see if there's any tumor. They can biopsy these tumors. Uh, they can also, uh, there's another channel in the ERCP scope where they can deliver a shock wave to, if there's any stones, they can fragment that stones and break it up uh, to retrieve uh, these stones. Mm -hmm. um, endoscopic ultrasound, it's another modality, uh, usually done by GI uh, doctors. Basically, they put the camera inside the, um, the stomach. At the end of the camera, at the end of the probe, there's a small ultrasound probe where they can scan the pancreas and the liver from mm -hmm. within the stomach. Also, if they see any, 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 any tumor in the pancreas, they can biopsy <clears throat> that tumor will get what we call FNA, which is fine needle aspiration biopsy. Um, so these, all these modalities improve the diagnosis of uh, pancreatic and, and biliary cancers. There's also a PET scan, which is basically a functional scan uh, the, what they do is they take sugar, they label that sugar with radioisotope, and they inject it into the blood. When you have cancer cell, they're dividing very fast, they're going to require sugar. So when you inject the sugar labeled with radioisotope, and then you roll the patient in the scan machine, wherever there is, where there is any cancer cells in the body, it would just light up on the, on the PET scan. And the neuron consumer uh, recently, in the last year, the FDA approved a new PET scan for neuron consumers. Uh, basically, what they do is they take a hormone called uh, somatostatin. They label that hormone with the radioisotope called the gallium-68, and they inject it into the blood. And when there, there, if there's any neuroendocrine tumors, uh, have the receptor for the somatostatin, 
uh, they will latch on it. And uh, when you roll him in the PET uh, scan machine, uh, these tumors will light up. So all these modalities improved our ability to diagnose all pancreatic and, um, and uh, uh, biliary uh, cancer and urinary tumors. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a wide range of uh, ability to, as I said, to pick up early cancer and improve the survival of patients. Exactly. And uh, doctor, um, are pancreatic and biliary conditions genetically predetermined? Uh, and what are the risk factors? Are the family history factor uh, uh, high or uh, lifestyle or the diet of a patient? Uh, what are the risk factors of uh, any? Pancreatic cancer? Yeah, pancreatic and biliary uh, cancer uh, uh, diseases, I mean. Um, risk factors for pancreatic cancers, um, the majority of pancreatic cancer related to like smoking, um, smoking is one of the highest risk factors for pancreatic cancer, obesity, uh, high fat diet, um, uh, exposure to chemicals, um, alcohol intake may or may not, chronic pancreatitis can lead to, um, um, to pancreatic cancers. Now, there are about maybe 10% of patients may have a family history of pancreatic cancer, and those patients have kind of genetic mutation, which they inherit these genetic mutations down, um, down, down the road and develop pancreatic cancer. For bile duct cancer, um, it's not genetically uh, related they are, uh, or inherited uh, from the family. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of bile duct cancer in the past, we used to see all these bile duct cancer in 70s and 80s. Nowadays, I've been seeing pancreatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma or bile duct cancer in patients in, in the 30s and 40s. And, um, and we attribute that to the diet we've been taking and the, these, all the preservatives they put in the, uh, in the frozen foods and the, uh, the antibiotics they feed the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the chickens and, yeah. and, and the animals hormones, and yeah. the hormones treatment. Yeah. Um, these all been attributed to increased risk of uh, bile duct cancers. Mm -hmm. And what about the liver cancer? Is it genetics? Oh, well, the liver cancers, they are, uh, the, the, the most common liver cancers are cancers spread from, from other organs, mm -hmm. uh, specifically okay. from the colon. Um, um, so the other 20% um, of cancer we see in the liver coming from the liver itself. Mm -hmm. And those tumors, they can be either tumors coming from the liver cells or they coming from the bile duct. Uh, tumors come to, coming from the liver cells, what we call hepatocellular carcinoma. 80% of these tumors, we see them on the background of liver cirrhosis. Or patients have, have uh, hepatitis C or hepatitis B. Uh, anybody who had liver cirrhosis, or hepatitis C and hepatitis B had about 5% increased risk of liver cancer every year. So if they have hepatitis C or cirrhosis for 20 years, 100% they're going to develop liver cancers. Mm -hmm. um, now, And what about alcohol? With the liver alcohol can lead to uh, alcohol can lead to liver cirrhosis, and as I said, liver cirrhosis can lead to cancer. Okay. Nowadays, in uh, in, the, in the U.S., uh, uh, fatty liver or what we call steatosis, mm -hmm. it's becoming one of the major risks for developing liver cancers. And the reason why, because liver uh, fatty liver uh, can lead to inflammation or what we call steatohepatitis, and that can lead to cancer. So, uh, doctor, what are the latest treatments available in case of cancer tumors uh, um, in this area uh, in the digestive system? And uh, is it still uh, uh, the only option we have, the conventional uh, major surgeries that we usually do, or are there other uh, treatments? Uh? Well, um, the paradigm for, for treatment of uh, pancreatic and liver cancer changed a lot in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, surgery is the, um, uh, is the only option that you can offer a patient for cure. Um, but nowadays, it's, it's, it's a multimodal, what we call multimodal therapy. What that means is it's a combination of chemo, surgery, or both. So for example, pancreatic cancer, um, what we do, we look at the patient, we look at the CAT scans, if that pancreatic cancer is resectable, what we call Resectable means that we can cut it out. There's no invasion of the veins and there's no distant metastases. And then we offer the patient surgery first. 
60 to 80 percent of patients when we do that kind of surgery they're going to have what we call positive lymph nodes or or tumor spread to the small lymphatic channels or blood vessels that means that the tumor already in the blood or in the in the lymph so uh, if you don't give them any treatment the cancer is going to come back for that reason uh, after surgery after about four or six weeks we give them what we call adjuvant chemotherapy to improve their survival now there are kind of debate about maybe we should start chemotherapy before the surgery, um, especially in patients who had what we call borderline resectable. What that means is, let's say that tumor is kind of big or just attached to the vein, and we cannot maybe we, we may not be able to cut it out. Let's give them chemotherapy first, cut it out, and then you give them chemo afterward. Uh, actually, MD Anderson and some other centers. On the chemotherapy or radiotherapy also to shrink the, the tumor or it's... Uh... So we start first with chemo, mm -hmm. um, reassess after 68 weeks. If mm -hmm. the tumor is not shrinking, then, then we, we offer them radiation therapy. You don't, as a surgeon, you do not want to have patient have radiotherapy before the surgery because it creates a lot of scar tissue there. <clears throat> so as I said, we get chemotherapy first mm -hmm. and then surgery. If the chemo is not working, you add radiation to it. So doctor, uh, can uh, pancreas and liver uh, disorders, or if you want, specifically cancer, can be prevented? And what are uh, the prevention uh, measures someone should take, or uh, especially with genetic predisposition, if someone has a ge genetic predisposition? So uh, it's all about lifestyle modifications, uh, especially the, uh, the pancreas. Uh, try to be healthy, eat healthy, avoid uh, smoking cigarettes. Uh, avoid fatty, greasy fried food. Um, from, the, from the genetic standpoint, if you know that somebody from your family had uh, the gene which predisposed to, uh, to uh, pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. uh, there are certain diseases which we know that increase the risk of, um, of uh, pancreatic cancer, genetic diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, those patients, they should get probably genetic analysis and get maybe an annual surveillance with getting a CAT scans or tumor markers every year. Just make sure um, they're not developing a new tumors in the pancreas or the liver. So doctor, we know that you are working on a new surgical technique uh, uh, to minimize uh, the complications uh, and rate, uh, the complication rate and blood loss following the pancreas and uh, liver surgeries. Can you tell us about this uh, new technique? So from the pancreatic, um, for pancreatic surgery, pancreatic surgery can be very delicate. You have to be very careful. The, the, you have to take your time when you do the operation, make sure everything is, uh, is secured before you start cutting. Um, recently, I've been, I've been using some devices which we uh, use for liver, uh, uh, for liver surgery. Um, those devices can minimize the amount of blood loss tremendously. Uh, what we found is when you, we have, a few, a little bit, a little bit of blood loss, patient recover very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it, it is devices um, um, we've been working on. Uh, we've been, uh, I've been improving some of the devices in, in, in collaboration with some of the uh, mechanical engineers up in Boston uh, to improve uh, the, the efficiency of these devices. And are you uh, for liver surgeries, um, a new technique uh, I, 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 I used, pay, especially in patients with Jehovah Witness, if they have a big tumors, uh, as you're aware, Jehovah Witness patients, they do not take any blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. So we, we, something with technique with what we call total vascular isolation, what that means is we cut the blood supply going into the liver and, and, and cut the blood going outside the liver. And uh, then we start dividing the liver and for that, during that period, which can last for about an hour, the remnant liver or the liver is going to stay behind. We perfuse it with, um, with preservation solution, like what we do for, for liver transplant. And, and that can cut down the amount of uh, blood loss tremendously. Um, okay, so, um, and we know also that you are working on a bioartificial liver organ uh, that you can transplant in a patient that uh, with an end stage uh, liver disease. Uh, where are you from this and uh, this research, uh, when will it be uh, available for everyone? <laughs> because really it's a breakthrough and it will help lots of people all over the world. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's why I, uh, I, I put a lot of effort into it. Uh, basically, what, what I do, <clears throat> we take a, a, a pig liver or um, liver from, um, from animal, and uh, we take the cells out of the, um, uh, the liver. Uh, we just keep the matrix, which is uh, conserved among all the species, all the mammals. And then we populate the matrix with uh, human livers. Uh, the challenge is to uh, populate that liver with billions and billions of liver cells. Um, uh, so that's the, that was a challenge. We try and get stem cells or what we call progenitor cells and try to differentiate these cells into uh, liver cells. Uh, that was, that's the challenge in, in trying to do that. We've been successful in differentiating these cells for, uh, for about a week, but then they go back to wherever they were before. So that was the challenge, trying to differentiate these cells into, into uh, hepatocytes or liver cells. And uh, do you think you will be able to, uh, to do this uh, on a human being soon? Or? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, but this is not something that's very challenging. A lot of people are working on it, and it's not easy to do, but we're working on it. Okay. So uh, we know that uh, the liver and pancreas disorders, along with the gallbladder and the bile duct, are very complex, and it needs uh, multidisciplinary groups to diagnose and treat. How do you, do, do you deal with that with patients in, uh, at Bader St. Luke uh, Medical Center? So um, what we have, uh, we have a multidisciplinary uh, a team um, and that involves surgeon, gastroenterologist, pathologist, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, uh, radiologist, interventional radiologist. We all meet uh, weekly on a, what we call the tumor board. We discuss all these patients. And um, these complex, especially the complex patients, um, all the all the specialties they get together and they uh, decide on the best treatment option for those patients. Um, and Baylor, we have a unique cancer center over here um, in our clinic. It's a combined multidisciplinary clinic. Uh, the surgeons and oncologists see the patient at the same time. We have also social workers and palliative medicines and dietitians. They're all in the clinic, so if I need something, I just go and grab uh, that person to come in and consult with the patients. So it's all about, uh, there's no uh, single, uh, these complex diseases cannot be tackled with, uh, with one specialty. You have to have multiple specialties. They come together in an organized fashion uh, to improve the, uh, uh, the outcome of those patients. And uh, doctor, usually a patient diagnosed with a pancreatic or liver cancer uh, feels condemned. Uh, maybe he will uh, he will be uh, he will feel that he's condemned to death. I mean, uh, what can you tell these patients and give them s some hope uh, about the prognosis of the disease? I mean, you know, you are saying that they came, they always come late uh, at a late stage in the disease. The cancer. Um, usually, I'm I'm kind of guy. Uh, what we call uh, over here, kind of a uh, uh, full glass, half half full, not half empty. Yeah. Uh, so that's why my attitude toward patient. Every patient I tell them, uh, especially the patients who are not candidate for surgery, uh, they have to go through chemotherapy. I tell them not to Google the disease, not to look into the statistics. Uh, the statistics are statistics. That doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, if they go and look into pancreatic cancer, they will say the five-year survival is only five or fifteen percent. Of that five, you, you could be one of those five or fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. Each patient behaves differently. The bi biology of tumors are different from one patient to another. They have to go through the chemotherapy first and see how they respond to it. If they are responding good to the chemotherapy and they tolerate the chemo well, just go through it and and see what happens. I have I've seen a lot of patients. I have many, many patients. I've been doing this for 25 years. I have seen a lot of patients actually with uh, very advanced tumors and they got chemotherapy. They have uh, responded extremely well. Nowadays for colorectal cancers and col uh, with liver metastases, uh, actually the breakthrough in the last few years is the immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. The immunotherapy, what they found is there are certain uh, missing genes in the in, in this colon cancer, which can happen about 15%. Those missing genes of those patients, if they have that missing gene, they can get immune therapy. And I've seen 
miracle response. I've seen tumors completely disappear. Um, so the, uh, the research is, is going, the research is, uh, there are a lot of people, smart people working on uh, uh, new drugs and new treatments. Um, so that's why I tell my patient, just keep your hope uh, the, high. And the immunotherapy is not available for everyone, especially, for example, in our region. It's, uh, it's well, very, immunotherapy, not every patient is going to respond to immunotherapy. Pancreatic cancer, the, probably the response is probably 2-3%. And um, and uh, and colorectal cancer, and uh, with especially with liver metastases, uh, if they uh, if the genetic uh, analysis confirmed that they're missing those what we call the mismatch repair genes, the MMR genes, if they're deficient of those genes, those patients actually showed um, amazing response to immunotherapy. Um, so not every patient will respond to immunotherapy. Um, there are a lot of trials trying to find what the best immunotherapy to use, what combination do you use them together or not. Uh, but immunotherapy as in, in those patients, they, they actually, this is what I think is coming in breakthrough in, in, uh, in cancer. So. Uh, doctor, what about uh, the COVID-19 and its effect on the uh, digestive system? We heard that uh, some complications of COVID uh, is in the digestive system. Is it true or where, where, where are we from the... Um, yeah, the I mean, some uh, COVID-19 is a mysterious uh, a virus. Yeah. Um, every time um, they come up with the new uh, symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, the other day, I, I, I've seen patient have rash, turn out be having COVID-19 from rashes. Um, um, the GI symptoms is well documented. Uh, the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, abdominal pain uh, is well documented in patients with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what are your uh, recommendations for people to prevent uh, uh, pancreatic and liver cancer with time, I mean, as a lifestyle? What can we do? Uh, quit smoking and... Uh, what kind of diet, for example, can we can we go? We know we know we hear about lots of diets uh, like uh, keto diet or uh, is it no, does it help? I'm against all these diets. To be honest with you, uh, my my recommendation is you have to have a balanced diet. You have to have fat, protein, and sugar, but it's always have be in moderation. You cannot just um, always have small portions and in moderation. You cannot just skip fat diet. Fat is important for your body to make hormones. You cannot skip uh, the sugar. Sugar is important for your um, uh, daily activity. And of course, you cannot skip protein. So you have to have a balanced diet uh, in, in, in moderation. Those keto diets and uh, this diet and fasting diet and uh, all that, it's... It's not sustainable, to be honest with you. you people go on on all those these diets for a month or two, and they uh, and they get some benefit out of it, but then they uh, it fails. And the reason why it fails because their diet is not balanced. They're always going to starve for for what they're missing. But if you're um, if you're diabetic, you need to control your diabetes. Yeah. Uh, that's important. Um, We've seen a lot of patients who diabetic eventually develop pancreatic cancer. The uh -huh. verdict is not out yet. Uh, what is the diabetes. relation between this? What is the relation between diabetes and uh, and pancreatic cancer? As I said, the verdict is not out yet. Um, nobody knows exactly which one caused which. Um, uh, a lot of patients uh, become diabetic um, for many years, but they don't have pancreatic cancer. Yeah. And um, and I've seen a lot of patients with pancreatic cancer, they develop, they become diabetic. Uh, so whether the diabetes ca caused the pancreatic cancer or pancreatic cancer caused diabetes, it's not very clear yet. Um, but as I said, um, if you're diabetic, you need to control your diabetes. Uh, if, if you have uncontrolled diabetes, then you're going to have more fat uh, depositions in the pancreas and in the, in the liver. And we know that fatty liver is, is, is carcinogenic. Uh, same thing for the pancreas. 
So a diet modification, uh, eat healthy, be active, uh, avoid uh, smoking, uh, and avoid alcohol, um, and you'll be fine. Well, I can't say, well, you're not going to have cancer. I mean, I've seen a lot of healthy individuals, they develop cancers, but, but at least that's what we have. That's what we can control. You lower the risks. Yeah. I'm sorry? You lower the risks of getting, uh, of having cancer, maybe, with this kind of lifestyle. I can't hear you. You lower the risk of getting cancer with this kind of lifestyle. Can you hear well, me? it's a low risk. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, doctor, thank you for your time. It was sure. a great having you with us. And uh, it was a very informative uh, session. Uh, thank you, and hopefully we'll... Uh, We'll have another interview soon. Sure, I'll be I'll be glad to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.